I'm currently the branch, branch head for um, Dharma in Canberra and welcome to this, this evening. Um, before we get started, I've got a couple of slides to talk to you about. Um, housekeeping, in the event of emergency, follow the instructions of staff here, yeah, nothing unusual there. Um, bathrooms are out, well, are the bathrooms outside the main door? Okay, down the corridor while you came in, you'll find them. Um, as usual, I'm going to um, suggest that uh, you should consider becoming a, data, a Dharma certified data management professional. Um, in recent years, DM Bok is becoming more and more um, recognized as a, as, a, as a resource, and the CDMP program is about recognizing you as somebody who knows about DM Bok. Um, and uh, yeah, I encourage you to, to give it some thought. Um, Personally, I was, I was one of the, the early certifiees in Australia, so good stuff. Um, we've got a bunch of stuff coming up. Um, in this slot next month, um, Kylie Watson, um, who is from Deloitte, that's what I thought, yes, um, is going to be talking to us about leveraging data for cybersecurity success. Um, that's our regular monthly, monthly meeting. So um, 17th of March. Apart from that, we currently have four special interest groups running in Canberra. Um, so they uh, have regular meetings. We've got one coming up on the, I don't want to say it's the 24th, but I can't swear to it. There is a data governance coming up shortly. At, um, they're held at the National Archives. Um, there's also the data modeling SIG. Uh, emerging data designs and the data availability and transparency stick. That's a new one. Uh, okay, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Brendan to talk to us about his data challenges. Brendan is the CIO at CSIRO, and I'm sure he's going to say some very interesting things. Brendan. Thank you, Simon. So now we're just going to get the technology started. Huh? It's been very interesting coming here this afternoon. Some of you might have seen me catching up with people I haven't seen for a long time. So uh, Andrew and Brendan Halloran and I uh, used to work together in, uh, we formed a branch called Data Management Branch in, um, uh, in Faxia way, way, way long time ago. Faxia doesn't even exist anymore. Um, I'll be back. I'll be back. <laughs> um, yes, it was a very successful entity. And um, we had lots of fun together. Uh, until my CIO at the time realised that uh, I was uh, holding on to bits of budget that he could put to other 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 ends, and so our grand plan started to fall apart. Um, Jeremy O'Keefe is also in the in the audience. So Jeremy and I uh, worked together in the Clean Energy Regulator, probably the Department of Climate Change as well. So uh, you can tell I've had some fun in my career, um, and. Uh, uh, been through quite a lot of data challenges. Um, I was going to try reading the speaking notes um, on the computer, but uh, I thought that might be a little bit of a bridge too far, so I've, I printed them out, so it's going to be a, a bit of a paper shuffling exercise, so I apologise for that. Um, but yeah, look, I'm here to talk um, uh, generically about my data challenges for uh, 2020, and I suppose just to, to formally go into where are we? Failed at the first step, and of course, it's not a touch screen. I've lost the first one. There we go. Back there. Um, so, so, just a little bit about me. So, I've worked uh, in and around information technology for a very long time. Um, uh, I started uh, uh, after graduating um, in, uh, at the ANU in Canberra. In, at CSIRO and uh, joining CSIRO again uh, about four years ago, uh, I realised that there was a, a man working for me who was at the other end of a very long value chain, which I happened to start by writing a brief to then executive director, I think it was called, CSIRO Information Communication Technologies um, Group or something like that. It was about the purchase of a Cray computer uh, and uh, basically I I, I, all I did was, some, was basically draft the minute uh, and uh, um, I, I ended up uh, 
you know, just a few years ago, actually having some of the people who installed that first prey, uh, which was, I, I can't remember whether it was at the Bureau of Meteorology or it was at CSIRO, but it was basically a shared computing resource between the two. So I've been in and around computing for a, a, or information management and technology for a long time. In the mid 90s, I worked for a, an organization that used to be just down the road here, the Federal Bureau of Consumer Affairs, and I was there as a policy advisor, and I wrote about um, consumer implications of this thing called the internet, and whether we'd all have cash, or whether we'd have credit cards, or, or whatever. Just a little bit about my team at CSIRO. So I've got about 500 people, 500 dedicated professionals working in the fields of information, data, and technology, supporting CSIRO science. We have about 8,000 users, so CSIRO's got about 5,500 staff, but we have 8,000 users because we have this category called affiliate. So it means that we can work um, with, I guess, closer collaborators because we bring them into our ICT, our data uh, environment. We support laboratories around Australia. We've got about 200 petabytes of data uh, under active management. Uh, and obviously we're now looking at, at whether we can scale beyond that. Uh, we have the best supercomputing capability in the country. I don't know whether there's anybody here from Bureau of Meteorology, but I have the best, so <laughs> let's just stick with that. Um, and uh, science information services. So basically we run a range uh, of information services for CSIRO uh, on top of our data uh, services. Um, so I'm gonna talk about data strategy, um, but I'm gonna try and keep it practical and look at what data strategy means in, in CSIRO. Now, Andrew mentioned to me that this is possibly not a, a, a common topic for Dharma, so please forgive me, uh, but hopefully in the question and answer session, if there are things that you, you wanna go deeper into and talk more deeply about CSIRO and the ecosystem that CSIRO works within, let's do that. So someone needs to keep me honest and make sure I only talk for 20 to 30 minutes so that we actually have some time uh, the questions and answers. But yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about CSIRO just so to make sure you all know what the organisation is. Um, talk about digital science, our digital strategy, uh, what the data component of that, of that is like and how we're doing it. And uh, as I said to a couple of people um, before we started, um, that uh, I want to talk about change management because in my vast career, um, change management people issues really are our biggest data challenge. Um, I can see some people nodding, so maybe in the question and answer session we'll get to, to talk about that. Um, so CSIRO, um, uh, this is a, just a, a generic slide, I'm getting a little bit old now and hopefully someone in, in corporate strategy will, will give us a, a new one. The background shows um, supercomputing facilities in Canberra Data Centre, so you all know Canberra Data Centre, um, so uh, Greg Bora uh, uses my supercomputing facilities as a bit of a tourist attraction. Uh, so if you have VIPs, I'm actually quite happy for him to show them uh, those facilities because it's a, a, it's a sales job for Australia. Uh, and I'm guessing most of the people here are in, or in government or working around government. So it's also good for Australian industry to realise that we have this kind of capability. And this is just some of the supercomputing capability in Australia, right? But this feature is not about supercomputing. So um, one of the things about, about um, the, uh, that particular pod at CDC is you actually need the earplugs before you get into it, right? So if you go into it, definitely take the earplugs. Um, so just to remind you what CSIRO has done for Australia, um, we invented Wi-Fi, please remember that. We invented Wi-Fi. We did actually make some money from inventing Wi-Fi as well. Uh, so many people don't realise that we did. Uh, and so that's part of uh, CSIRO's commercialisation revenue, uh, even to this day. You can see a lot of other things there that we've, that we've invented. Um, other things, just to, to let you know, one of the great things about CSIRO is we take available technology and we work out how best to use it. So some people sort of talk about, oh, is CSIRO getting into consulting work and stuff like that. In a way we have to, because part of the benefit of CSIRO is working out how to use available technology in really, really smart ways. Uh, and that means that IP is a kind of a different thing. We're actually advising people on 
how to actually get the best out of what they're, what they're looking to do. Just to bring this up to date, um, we're currently working on a cure at a place called our Animal Health Laboratory, which is down in, Ge in Geelong. So Animal Health Laboratory is where the Hendra virus uh, cure, if you like, uh, was, was invented. So we're currently working on uh, the coronavirus there and uh, let's hope that the team there or somewhere else finds a cure for that relatively quickly. So that's just a little bit about CSIRO, a national organisation. Uh, actually, I'm going to go back to my notes just to make sure I've covered everything. Uh, we're about 100 years old. Um, our, our mission, which is kind of enshrined in our legislation, but this is, I guess, taking the mission out of the legislation. Legislation says more than just this is to solve uh, uh, the greatest tra challenges through innovative science and technology. And I guess in terms of where CSIRO is going, we're looking to take that um, mission uh, extremely seriously. Again, just telling you a little bit about CSIRO. So these are the kinds of uh, science areas that, that, that we cover. Um, we're, we're looking at these areas and we're calling them our missions. Um, and uh, pretty much underpinning the missions, we have a vision uh, that we're, we're looking to solve bigger challenges. So, you know, the kind of challenges we're talking about is to bring drought resilience to Australian agriculture, remove plastics from the environment. So these are big challenges that are actually causing people uh, heartache and concern uh, at the moment. Uh, other challenges are about climate change, uh, and uh, the health and biosecurity challenges. So for example, when we're talking about the coronavirus, let's not wait until a new virus outbreak has occurred. Let's look at ways to make healthier populations so that we're actually uh, addressing uh, the, the, the causes of those outbreaks rather than um, treating the symptoms once they've, once they've um, <coughs> occurred. Um, and yeah, so our science goes across uh, environmental science, food and agriculture, health and well-being, uh, industries, we talk about future industries here, sustainable energy and resources, uh, and a secure Australia and, and region, which basically means that we're looking at not um, necessarily the kind of security uh, issues that, that uh, Homeland, but, um, Homeland Security uh, talks about, but those sort of secure, the security of our uh, employment for our population, you know, biological control of, of pests at our borders and, and those sorts of things. So, when's he going to start talking about data? Well, maybe not for a little while. Um, so, what I wanted to do now is sort of segue from CSIRO and a vision for CSIRO, which is about solving the greatest challenges, and a strategic focus for CSIRO, which is about um, depicting challenges and then looking at the way we can scale up large-scale projects to, to address those challenges. So have a little bit of a discussion about what science looks like in 2020. And some of you who may be in the know may even know that some of the things I'm talking about are actually older than 2020. So this is what I'm talking about is not necessarily new, but there's, a, there's I guess, a, a, a new element to it from my perspective. I want to talk here about the integrated marine observing system. So it's not a CSIRO <coughs> system. This is an, uh, what we call a national facility and CSIRO along with other government partners uh, and universities are partners in this uh, integrated marine observation uh, system or service. But anyway, it says system, so let's go with system. Um, so basically what this is about, and if we look at, let's just see if I can get the, uh, here. So we look at this side of this slide. Basically what we're doing is we've got a lot of sensors, <coughs> excuse me, we're putting them in the ocean, we're putting them on a dugong, um, somehow we've got tuna associated with sensors as well in that little image. Actually, I'll see if I can just um, make this a bit bigger. Um, is that working? You can see, can you see the little dugong there? <coughs> and uh, you can see the tuna in the ocean. So basically what we're doing is we're mapping an ecosystem, right? So we're looking at the oceans around Australia uh, and uh, you know, we have a whole bunch of sensors, 
know we've this says we've got 26 ocean gliders. I don't know whether we actually have 26. I've seen a few of them. They've got shark bites on them and things like that. They're quite quite interesting. Uh, they're basically drones, underwater drones. Um, Argo float. I actually think that that's at least in part a CSRO invention. Um, we've got the, the ship off there that could be Soros RV investigator. You may well know that we have a beautiful vessel that goes around the coast of Australia doing amazing science. Uh, we've got deep water moorings that are taking readings from the ocean. But so basically what we're looking at is an integrated system for, for monitoring um, an EPS system. Um, so it's also multidisciplinary. So there's multiple science disciplines that come to play here. There's marine biology, there's geophysics, um, there's climate science. Um, I'm not being a scientist, so I don't have an exhaustive list, but you know, you know what I'm saying. So it's a multidisciplinary activity. And what I want to say to you is that, that this is more and more what science, particularly from CSRO's perspective, um, uh, is about. So in the old days, science would be about you know tracking a dugong and talking about dugong's life cycle, etc. That's still science, and that still is happening. Hello, Olga. Um, please take a chair. <laughs> Olga and I used to work together as well <laughs> at Paxia and at the Clean Energy Regulator. She's a glutton for punishment. <laughs> um, and so, where was I going with this? So basically, we're mapping an ecosystem, and uh, um, it's it's multidisciplinary. So we're looking at different science domains that, that that come about. But I guess what what the, the message here is that um, we aren't just answering the, the what I say the, the what's that for science question or the how does that work science question. Um, now in in fields as disparate as agriculture, energy, minerals. So this is a like an environmental sciences um, uh, one, but we, we, we use it in all of our science disciplines. We're talking about modeling ecosystems, right? And we're talking about perhaps how humans interact with those eco ecosystems or human activities interact with these, like plastics, for example. Do you know, I've, I've, Sarah is a very, I'm very fortunate to get the job in Sarah. I've been to London and visited the Natural History Museum in London. And in the bowels of the Natural History Museum, there was someone dissecting a fish from the Thames. And guess what they found in his gut? Microplastics. And they showed me just as they were doing it. Just, see, there'll be microplastics in here as well. Um, so, but what I wanted to get to is the fact, the fact that what we're talking about is modeling um, ecosystems. And modeling ecosystems is all about data. Taking a long time to get to it, but I've finally spoken about data. <laughs> Um, and what we're looking to do is to do this work at scale uh, and to use it in terms of monitor monitoring and making predictions. So, so where is science at the moment? So it's, it's it, from a CSRO perspective, it's genuinely multidisciplinary. It's borderless. So, you know, we'd be sharing information here and in, from the IMOS perspective with New Zealand and we'd be looking at cross flows across uh, the Tasman uh, the Tasman Sea, uh, but we're also looking at CSRO agriculture and how in bad agriculture and how does what we're looking at it in agriculture um, uh, basically talk to the world and to global problems uh, in ag agriculture. It's responsive and reproducible. So this again brings forward the data challenge. So those of us who had the, the both the fortune and the misfortune to work through the whole of the Australia's attempts to put a price on carbon know how much of a body blow was hit to that initiative when uh, emails from particular academics were leaked that questioned each other's research. That's always going to happen, I think, that there's going to be questioning. What we have to do is show from a data perspective that the ecosystem that IMOS is mapping is actually reproducible and it's, it is actually a real mapping of that, of that, of that ecosystem. Um, so it's data intensive and it's data driven. So digital science underpins everything we do and more and more um, we're looking to employ computer models. So there we were looking at a, an ecosystem and you could say that we have a model of that ecosystem but I think you know, what people are becoming more familiar with is the idea of a digital twin, 
But we build something in a computer which is replicates something in the physical world so that we can basically test full stress test, whatever you want to do with, the, with that model uh, in a computer. Digital science is about, is about algorithms. So, you know, basically we, we, some of us had a conversation earlier about um, uh, some data people around Canberra who've never heard of relational databases. They only know about machine learning and, and, and other things. I can't remember where, what that comes I think it was Jeremy who we were talking about that. And of course it's about, it's about big data. And, but, you know, big data, I, I, I must admit, I want to make meaningful with all of you, not just have a term, big data. The other thing about all of this is it's all data. That D represents the fact that it's done. See the D up there? Yes, good, it came up. I would even say that the algorithms are data and that we need to treat them in much the same way we treat other data assets. So where am I up to? Lost my place. place. Um, so back to IMOS. And the reason I want to come back to IMOS this time is I actually want to talk about this side here. So NCI, some of you know, is a supercomputing center at the ANU uh, and uh, uh, CSIRO, the Bureau of Meteorology, Meteorology Geoscience Australia and the ANU are partners in, in NCI. We're just about to launch a brand new supercomputer. In fact, it's already running called Guardi and that should be the fastest supercomputer in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, but why am I talking about it? I'm not talking about it because it's a fast supercomputer. I'm talking about it because it's an element of what I want to say is a data ecosystem that supports the IMOS mapping of a physical ecosystem. And in this speech, what I want to say is in terms of CSRO's data strategy is that we're taking discussions about data ecosystems seriously. Um, so on this side of this, this, this image, and uh, my, I might go back out of the, uh, the magnified bit. Um, we're talking about um, data, technologies, tools, techniques applied by skilled people uh, to basically generate uh, information about the IMOS ecosystem that's, that's being mapped. We've created data, this, this creates a data ecosystem. In many ways, it's no dis different to, to what I would say are many of the data ecosystems that people who work for government departments in Canberra work with. So I, I must admit, if I'm, if I'm trying to push a particular line, I would like us to have a discussion about this concept of data ecosystem. Um, having worked in facts here, I can tell you that I think that the transaction payment systems the grant systems, the um, geospatial analysis of grants recipients create an ecosystem of data around a particular thing that for some reason we're, we're interested in. I don't think in terms of um, nature, it's any different to a science data ecosystem, which is actually about a physical natural world ecosystem. And I think there are some learnings that we can take from that. One of the things as we move through this, and I'll, I'll, I've mentioned it already, is, um, and, and I know working in social security, working in immigration, working in other places, this is the bane of our life, is how do you get reproducibility? Everyone questions, you know, have you got the right data source? Is that the right answer for the minister, uh, et cetera? Again, it's no different here. In some ways, the stakes are higher though, because uh, a whole interpretation about how a natural world ecosystem uh, works could fall flat on its face because something that was written about that ecosystem cannot be reproduced. So problems over here get reflected over here. If we haven't set, am I near a speaker microphone now? If, I have, if we haven't set this up right, then we, we've lost the, the reproducibility. And I think this is the point I, I mentioned this here. Um, so historically for, for science, as in term, as, as in fact for us as data workers or whatever we want to call ourselves, this has been the sexy side of the picture, right? Because you can have cute 
footage of a dugong. You can go out on a ship in the high seas, you know, with a marine biologist looking at tuna jumping out of the water. This isn't sexy. And it costs a lot of money to run a ship. So in science, what has happened historically is there's been big borrowing or stealing to get this side of this puzzle to work. Syro's lesson is we can't scale if we work like that. We have to treat this as though, so me as a CIO, I'm delivering the production standard. We have set one outages, all that sort of stuff on this side. That's, that's a new thing for science, right? Um, so anyway, this is, this, this, is, this is where we're taking our, our, our strategy. And the reason we're doing it is because we know we need to scale. And so to scale, you need to have designed your systems well, um, or at least sensibly, and using standards that everybody understands. Um, and we have to support reproducibility. Um, in CSIRO, we have many data ecosystems. And I'm just going to, I think now, flick through to um, next time I do this presentation, I'll get much more sexy video um, slides on, on this. This is the Collaborative Crystallization Center. Um, and when I'm just even mentioning that name, I realized that there's, there's, there, there is actually hundreds of data ecosystems, even just within CSIRO. So the Collaborative Crystallization Center is a place in Melbourne. It's one of the world's foremost centers for growing crystals. I don't know why people want to grow crystals, but it is one of the world's foremost centers for growing crystals. And you can do all sorts of research on the back of it. You can actually start to specify like a particular crystal because I'm looking for a particular effect and it's not like the jewelry or anything like that. It's because it has some, do you know about this? Olga has, 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 is an environmental scientist, so she might know a little bit about these, these sorts of things, more than me anyway. Um, the other one, and just, just bringing it really to, to the forefront, there's a lot of discussions around Canberra, and I'm sure some people in this room have been dragged into these, about what are we going to do about the bushfires. So um, CSRO has some tools. Again, we have a, a data ecosystem. This is the old way of doing bushfire prediction. Um, it was relatively useful, but it came out in 1967. Data61, uh, uh, our digital arm, is working on uh, a platform called Spark, and then we have this ecosystem, Eric, which is basically about getting to emergency services uh, with, with the information. So now you've probably noticed that what was science and relatively manageable, I've got a cardboard thing that moves around and, you know, I'm now going into a world of genuine CIO land where my science needs to be presented to the people we rely on to save our properties and our lives. Uh, and it can't go down like the emergency services site in, in Canberra, probably in this room is one of the better educated groups to know why that might happen. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, so it's, a, it's another example of an ecosystem and it's another reason why our data strategy has to mature within, within the organisation. Um, so what we're talking about is so we've got lots of ecosystems, lots of data ecosystems in CSIRO and with our partner agencies, Geoscience Australia, Bureau of Meteorology, um, et cetera. What we're talking about is creating managed data ecosystems. Wow, took me a long time to think, think that up. Um, I basically said, well, why don't we just manage it? There you go, initiative form. Um, so what do we want to get from a managed data ecosystem? We want to get more discoverable and accessible data. You might have heard of the FAIR principles. You probably have lots of views about the FAIR principles. I won't go into them here. Um, we, want it to make, we want to make it easier for internal and external collaboration, like with the fire part, the fighters, et cetera. We want to be able to bring in cutting edge tools, technologies uh, to enhance research outcomes. So instead of it being big, borrow or steal, we actually have the tools and we talk to the researchers about what are the best tools for your, for your particular problem. We're going to worry about compliance. So again, this is an issue that researchers have not been good at understanding. Um, you know, there is a whole world of compliance, which people in this room, I think, are far more familiar with than most of the, the researchers that I would speak to. Um, interestingly, um, researchers are the first people who want to meet compliance requirements. So it's almost like they've been waiting for us to talk to them about how to, to, to do this. Um, and then 
I guess the other question, and we'll come back to it at the end, uh, we've got to improve data literacy and uh, data capabilities within our organisation because we're talking about ramping up to a level of maturity that we don't currently have. Uh, probably not over half an hour, have I? Who's keeping time? And miles of time. Uh, miles of time, okay. Um, 27, it says 27 minutes. I just realised that there's a counter on here. Um, so how are we approaching the development of data, managed data ecosystem? Um, basically, this is, a, you know, you've all seen this before. This is an attempt to break down um, any organisation into some simple architectural sort of groupings. Um, we've got to worry about our technology platform. Uh, we've got to put in place governance. We've got to have information architecture and standards. And why don't I go through the rest of the slide rather than just trying to do it without it. So for example, in, in, in our technology platform, uh, we need to build a, well, we're already building a, a, a multi-cloud strategy. So we have cloud tenants, we have internal cloud, and now we need to talk to our partners about also having a managed cloud strategy. So it's not the researcher who manages the cloud, it's actually the organisation that manages the cloud on behalf of the researcher. The researcher at least has guardrails in that cloud so that they can start to, to do the stuff that they want to do. There was another point I wanted to make there, so I'll just find my... Um, I hate saying I've got a piece of paper. <laughs> Sound like um, the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Um, if anybody knows what that means, I'll give them a prize right there. Um, uh, so, for example, when we looked at the IMOS um, example, there is no consistency in the way that data is captured from all of those sensors. So we have farms, we have uh, um, national parks, we have um, areas where we're supporting indigenous ranges. We have sensors all over, the Harbour Bridge is full of sensors, you probably didn't know that. Um, and Data61 does analysis on those sensors on, on, on the Harbour Bridge. What we don't have is a consistent way to pull data from IoT devices. Uh, so that we can do it with certainty, we know the provenance of the data, and we're starting to actually think about whether those sensors are working and all those sorts of things. So there's a technology element where we have to do that. Um, we're going to do enterprise data modelling, and Andrew and I often have conversations in terms of, oh, I don't understand enterprise data modelling, I don't understand data modelling. Um, but we have to do it. So we have people who do, do data modeling in, in, in CSIRO, but they do it from a project perspective. And I think often in our working life, we see um, uh, projects that are set up with government within government agencies where a data model is created for that project. Um, executives think that that means that they've solved a problem. They don't realize they've just created another problem. <laughs> they've created another bunch of technical debt, right? Um, so we have to be smarter about doing that. I've got a bigger problem than you guys because each discipline teaches different ways of doing data model, right? But, you know, sounds like a fun challenge. So we, 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 we have to provide some kind of distri distributed governance uh, around the way we do data modeling. Um, but, you know, that's all, that's all part of the, the, the puzzle. We've talked about here about incentives frameworks. And so what I'm really talking about here is professionalizing our data workforce. So quite often in, in science, um, uh, you know, we, we get PhDs, or we get people who are doing PhDs, we use them to extend um, uh, the science capability that we have, you know, basically while they're getting their PhD, they're doing research that, you know, flows onto some other um, output. Quite often we get those PhDs to go beyond their professional competency because they're cheap and they did some C sharp or something while they were at uni. Uh, and they start, you know, building stuff. They might build technology, they might be building data sets, they might be building workflows. Who knows? What we need to do is we need to professionalize that activity uh, and we need to provide incentives, so rewards, um, but also 
position descriptions. Um, you know that, that there is this kind of uh, activity that needs to be done within within the within um, our workforce, uh, and that we have a way uh, of doing that. And then the last one is, um, and I'm thinking, if you've got an information, if you've got an information or data governance group, we might we might go there as well. Um, is we have to do information governance. So um, many of you have seen information governance or data governance initiatives that have, you know, uh, fallen apart because particular executives, you know, don't quite see the benefit of going along to meetings and you get copious amounts of secretary of work happening and uh, all gets a little bit frustrating after a while. And then the deputy secretary who was the champion leads and suddenly what do you do? Um, so we have to make it a real part of our organisation. And so what we're talking about is when there's a research project, the research project does a data plan. Uh, when the business unit, so we have science impact business units. When the business unit is looking at its science, it does a data plan, right? So mapping to that strategy. It doesn't have to be nth degree, but it's basically saying that we think we need to be collecting this kind of data, et cetera. We've started that sausage machine of a discussion within the organisation. And we also start to recognise that if we put fingers to keyboard about the need to collect this stuff and use this stuff, we're also thinking about resources to do it. Um, so, so within this initiative that I'm kicking off or that we're, we're into within CSIRO, we're actually talking about changing CSIRO's business process. Uh, and again, I think that that's something that um, uh, we can all take away when a world that is talking about data all the time, why do we all feel so frustrated about those conversations? And one of the reasons is we're not, we don't have a seat at the table about you know, the business process, the governance of the organisation, organisations that are actually created to create, use, report on whatever data. So it is a kind of a different way of looking at things, I think, but we'll get to that in the question and answer session. You might just tell me it's money for old road money. It's later do. Um, the so so change management becomes uh, and this is pretty much my final slide. So change management becomes the thing. So we need high levels of participation across the organisation to us to achieve this ecosystem uh, effect. Uh, we need large numbers of individuals to change the way they work. And this says believe in the MDE vision. Now I don't know that I'm going to say that again. I said it to the team. So we need to get them to believe in the MDE vision. I don't think I'm going to go out and say, you need to believe in the MDE. Change you can believe in. Um, and we need to basically have a change management strategy that supports that. While I, I criticise my own, you know, um, believe in the vision, that actually is the, the most important thing, I think. Uh, and I said to the CFO of CSIRO just uh, yesterday, if we have to take a budget cut on this initiative, which perhaps we will have to next year, can we please not cut the budget on training? Because the biggest uplift for me is to get training across the board in CSIRO, and I suspect that that's true for other organisations. <coughs> so where, where are we going to end up? So um, this is the vision. I know it's just an image, but this vision of an ecosystem of ecosystems is, is the vision, right? So we have a register, some kind of register. We've already got ideas about how to do that. It's not a dumb old fashioned register. It's something that would be like a Google like search and, and other things, which talk, say something about the other ecosystems that CSRO is interacting with. But we've also started to talk about some business rules about that interaction. So more and more we can get to machine to machine interaction within these, these ecosystems. Um, I mean, that is quite a big vision, but um, I, I think if we don't do it, we're not going to be able to achieve Larry Marshall's vision of being able to scale science to achieve, to solve big challenges. So we've, we adopt a, a new operating model that leads to higher levels of professionalization in data and technology management across research. We work on the purposeful creation of enduring data facilities. So IMOS was a pur purposeful creation, but we had to create a whole institution to support it. I and mean, it's not sustainable to be going, to be building like that for all of the challenges that we had but we need to be purposeful about it and we need to be smarter about the way we do technology for these things. 
Um, as I said, science should expect the kind of technology uh, reliability that people who work within government departments and large commercial enterprises expect. Um, and we need to have facilities, and this is the, the image on the side, um, that link across the SRO and with our research partners. And I think that's me done. So that says thank you. And this one says questions. <laughs> so thank you. Are there any questions? Brendan. Brendan. Um, three, three things there struck a, a, a chord with me. Um, the first one was Neville Chamberlain. <laughs> Neville Chamberlain, very good, yes. Okay, sure. I have in my hand a piece of paper. And yeah. it, is the Chairman <laughs> Chancellor's signature or whatever? Yes. Um, number two was when I was a child at Duffy Primary, I was taught the Amazon was going to impact our bushfire threat of the future. And I guess that's the issue you're talking about with why. Um, Canberra failed and the uh, bushfire emergency system went down. That was thanks to the Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the headley, I, don't, look, I don't think it was due to Amazon. I think it was due to just people not in, the, in the technology department not taking the advice of Amazon and, and building the scale the way yeah. that they should have. So, yeah. you know, that's, I don't know that for sure. But yeah, just I think you're probably right. Yep. Um, can you just jump back to your seven point? Um, slide of both of those different issues. Which one? Uh, back one more, I think it was. Uh, yeah, this one. Yeah. Just on that, that left-hand panel there. And I'm thinking, I'm sure we've all been involved in failed projects and um, these sort of things around data. If you haven't, you're probably in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> well, not honest. Um, in, uh, they just did support work. us, Brendan. That, yeah. that was the problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you're going to put a tick against each time an area that failed in those projects, against one of those seven areas, is the one that keeps standing out there. I've got one in my mind, but um, I just wanted to know what your thoughts were. Um, yeah, look, I, I always think it's easier to do this when you actually have a program, like and you can drive a program, you can drive standards, you can focus on your own people, you know, you can do all of those things. Um, I don't know that there is one standout for me because I see failures on all of those. The one we've just talked about with, with the, the ESA website, obviously is a number six failure. Yeah. I think census was a number six failure, <laughs> you know, where, where for whatever reason, people didn't take the advice and didn't use the available technology in the way it should have been used. Um, and hopefully I won't get lots of bad emails because I just said that. Um, so governance is the one that's always been most painful for me. You know, that, that story about the Deputy Secretary leaving, some of you in this room will know that we had Deputy Secretary champions and we were flavour of the month and our data management governance group was just starting to get going and then um, so uh, you know some of us have been fortunate he's no longer in the public service but to work with Jeff Leifer and whenever I had Jeff Leifer as the deputy secretary who was chairing the governance we were going fantastically mm -hmm. but of course Jeff always went and left and went somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> um, so governance is the one that I found most difficult but actually it's the people change management one and, uh, you know, I think we can think about issues both within our own branch in Faxia, but then within the wider Faxia and with uh, what's now human services, the, the, where there were change management issues that were really getting in the way. Um, and those of you who were with me with the clean energy regulator know I made a big mistake around change management there. Um, but, um, uh, but we still got it done. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, what, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I think it keeps going back to people and all those other issues you talked about where often someone making a decision, mm. you know, it wasn't don't put a backup system or don't do this. Someone probably suggested that to the ACT government, but someone says, no, we don't need mm. that or this. And uh, I guess what I keep seeing though is us as IT and, and data professionals often don't focus on, but, you know, we know the, the people are complex, but it's much easier yeah. to focus on the technology or the data or it, something else. It is. Instead of the people. It is. And, and you know, 
um, we, we, we're involved in an engineering discipline. There are some interesting developments around Canberra at the moment, so I don't know if any of you know Jennifer Bell at the 3A Institute. Her whole vision is the only way to get control of um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, in the commas, um, autonomy, autonomous vehicles, all those sorts of things, is to bring human-centred design to, to engineering as a first principle. So we can't build. I know I, I had uh, an interaction with Telstra a couple of years ago, and Telstra used to tell, I don't know whether they still do it, their deep, like you, you, a project that's changing switches in some network sort of, they had to write a media lead release before they could get the money to kick that project off. I think that's fantastic. So deeply technical projects need to understand the business rationale for why they're, they're functioning. Otherwise, you just go down a technical path. Anyway, I'm talking too much. More questions? The uh, professionalisation of yep. the data people, given the, the data link. <laughs> yeah. So what, what are you doing there? How are you? So a couple of things. So one, um, working with my HR colleagues, and if there's any listening, uh, working very successfully with them. Um, <laughs> on, uh, so we've got an initiative coinciding with, with this initiative called Digital Academy. They're focused on uh, talent. So how do we bring the, the, you know, the sort of people that this vision uh, and the challenges uh, idea for science requires? So they've started with that. Um, right now we're talking about, okay, well, you know, we also need some base level training and some other things. We have an initiative that's um, sort of getting off the ground and I'm interested whether Dama would be interested in it uh, with the University of South Australia, the ANU, University of New South Wales, uh, Curtin, and a couple of the other universities to set up, um, I guess, a university um, hub where we're focusing on the kind of skills that university probably doesn't teach. And that might be more around what we call cutting edge digital science, which is more a mentoring generally um, scenario. But that, that, so that initiative is, um, is getting gaining traction and Defence Science and Technology Group uh, and Bureau of Meteorology and Geoscience Australia are interested in that as well. We've just got Australian Computer Society to say that they're interested in it. Um, so, so we've got some, some of those sorts of things happening. But, you know, ultimately we're going to have to set ourselves KPIs and we're going to have to talk about, you know, the number of staff that have been through Cloud Basics or whatever. Um, you know, you have to start with those sort of, um, I guess, more standard kinds of actors. Maybe I'll go through Cloud Basics as well, I've never actually done it. Um, uh, and, and then you, you, you know, you, you, you work up the stack. I think, I think the other thing we have to do is to actually get um, science colleagues to understand career paths for people who have the expertise in, in, in these areas. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's multifaceted, I guess. So for the governance, and your, your experience of governance too, that sort of executive level, yeah. is that part of the targeting of what you're doing? Part of the, the executive level? It is. So we, we have a, a Data Governance um, Steering Committee within CSIRO. Um, we're still in, I guess, what you would call sort of, so this is internally funded, right? So we can sort of cut our cloth to, you know, our own timeframes for that. Yeah. Um, we've agreed on this operating model, so more detail than I've given you here. Um, and now we're actually talking about how to imp implement that, that operating model. Um, and um, uh, so what does it mean for each business unit? And my expectation is it means when they're thinking about that, just like I said before, when they're thinking about strategy, they think about the data components of that strategy. Maybe I'll provide them some people that help them with that. Uh, or maybe they'll have people, their own people that still need to work that out. Um, they'll be looking at the cost of data, uh, the cost to their business. And um, we still got to work out whether we maybe have some showback arrangements. It's generally easier around technology than it is around data. Um, so there's sort of a few things to work out there. Um, but yeah, so basically working it up as a as a 
um, a, a new aspect of our organisational business process. We're going to start with a policy. It's an information governance policy. It says this is the way we do information and data in CSIRO. Um, and then uh, my hope is as we push through the other initiatives that that policy becomes like a, a bit of the, a keystone to the framework and other things, other people will start to take it on and say, okay, that's our policy. How do we make it real in the organisation? Um, as I said, it's a major change management journey. Just an observation, I think on, on the governance piece, um, I've experienced with a lot of clients at the, the executive level, the level of debt and literacy yes. is global. Yeah. And you can't govern what you don't understand. Yeah. And, and without that data <coughs> literacy, you can do all sorts of really great things in terms of governance processes and stuff. But at the end of the day, the senior executive sitting around the table got no idea what it is that they're governing. Yeah. It, it, it's, at the moment, it's a real chronic problem because they then on the sign them up on stuff. Got no idea what they're yeah. So, so this, in a sense, kicked off from an executive <laughs> meeting um, that I was in, where Larry, you know, Larry and I had a discussion before he did it. But he went round to his senior executive, you know, the conference table, mm -hmm. uh, and basically said, "Do you know where your most valuable data assets are?" And they all looked at each other. And said, well, Brendan, tell us. <laughs> um, I feel like they have, because we all, so we believe that this digital journey for CSRO is an existential one, like it's an existential um, threat if we don't grapple with it positively. Yeah. Um, so my belief is that they will take up that challenge. And, 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 and as, a, as you know, to a certain extent, scientists, do know about data, they just don't think they know about data because you know they're, because they're dealing with data all the time. It's just that there are better ways and worse ways to do things. That's where they start to get a little bit, you know, uh, concerned. But I agree with you that, that the broader literacy across the Australian scene, not just the APS, I think you know, industry as well, um, data and technology literacy as well. Um, is uh, not as high as it should be, and you know, you know, Dart Six One has some activities that, that, that are helping that, uh, but we have to do it in Syria. I think. Yeah. And look, I think part of the problem is people think, oh, I buy stuff on eBay, I download from Netflix, you know, I've got apps on my phone. I get technology. Yeah. I understand it. Yeah. But unfortunately, it's so superficial. It's it's scary. It is. And as soon as you sort of approach it. And, and as you say, where, where are our you know, most valuable information assets? Do you know what's a valuable information asset? It looks <laughs> like yes. no, so what, 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 what is it? Yeah. So it, it is, and, and you know, we've been doing a lot of educational work with our clients, and it's 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 absolutely scary. I think, mm. the moment. It, it's not just they need a bit of an uplift, it's just they need absolutely nothing. Yeah. And it, it's starting to be able to do that. I, look, so, I think. Um, you know, we do all of you know Ellen Broad. So Ellen um, used to work in Data Six One. She now works with Genevieve Bell at the Three A Institute. Her book, um, made by humans. It's it's you you'll all read it and you'll go, oh, finally someone said that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so for us it's so obvious, but it also the the the, the message is I think through that book, um, you know, because Ellen's you know written quite a nice, entertaining, easy to understand. Um, description of, of the problems. There's actually, I would encourage you all to read it because I actually think that there's a pathway through in that book. She hasn't said this is the pathway, um, but it is sort of, I think, using the kind of logic that she brought to the book, and that is that um, just because it's delivered to you by technology doesn't mean that it's either good, um, worthwhile. Um, Validated, whatever you know. I, I probably I should have thought it up. From now on, I'll think of five things I can say. Um, you know, it, it, it's made by humans. It includes human fallibilities, um, human biases, whatever. I think when you start talking to executives about that, they get it, and then they go, "Okay, well, what do I do now?" And then we have to be able to respond to them about what to do now. So, I do think there's a level of. Um, I, I feel like. Executives need to be able to 
it's a caveat emptor question. You know, they they need to they need to be Kenya buyers, if you like. They don't need to know everything that sits under underneath it. And uh, I, as I say, I would recommend Alan's, Alan's book uh, and maybe even giving it to your executives to have a read uh, because that might be helpful to your course. We give the copies of the DMBOT, but no, <laughs> no, the, <laughs> so the I think, sorry, the camera's over here. I think DMBOT is fantastic, right? Um, and it's fantastic for all of us. Um, you know, I've got Andrew to give me a copy and I threw it at a few people in, in Saro and, you know, um, it's a nice heavy, heavy book. Um, but that's for us. Like, it's like, it's like, oh, it's, right? it's, 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 it's for practitioners to understand better practice. Um, so, you know, I would use DMBOC to sort of confirm some of the things we're doing um, in this, but I wouldn't give it to my, uh, my colleagues. Um, I think it's better to have that dialogue with them about the realities of data, you know, to get smarter about like giving them some interesting books. You know, there's the one on, um, I've actually forgotten that one too, the, the American author that came out around the book out around Christmas time and is, is critical of Google and Google's um, practices. Um, just forgotten what it's called. Yeah. Maybe we'll put a link in and I'll, I'll give you some of my reading to, mm -hmm. to think about. Hmm. Okay, Jeremy, first. Who have you been with this uh, Alloys and Champions? That's a Larry. Um, Adrian Turner, former head of Data61. Uh, the current head of Data61, Simon Barry. Uh, not boss. Syro is full of them. In fact, um, uh, that's how I'm fortunate, right? More fortunate than I have been in other, other places. Um, one of our very, very influential um, leaders, science leaders, former head of agriculture and food, basically got up during a session a year and a half ago, and he was the one who said, if we don't do this, then Australian science just isn't going to progress. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we, you know, the Larry Marshall is very, very heavily behind this initiative. So, sorry, that was I'm sorry. Um, thanks very much for sharing the insights and particularly from CSR Pro. Um, I suppose in the current context at the moment of the sharing information across agencies and organizations, yeah. I appreciate some of the insights you see in those challenges, um, particularly where there's a maturity of some organizations, not the other. Um, and then obviously that combines with that sort of security umbrella that sits across the top. It, it certainly does. So, um, Australian Computer Society has issued something called the Five Safes. Um, so, uh, Ian Opperman, uh, I know, is very you know, instrumental in, in, in publishing that. I think CIOs need to understand what the five states mean, um, get it come to terms with that. Um, if CIO has a peer who's the data you know, head, then data head also needs to get across that. And then I would say that the secretaries also need to understand what that means. Again, I think it's written in such a way that, that it's not you, know, you realise it isn't actually rocket science. It's just common sense. You know, we wouldn't make some of the business decisions we've been making if we were thinking about personally buying a house. Um, you know, because many of the decisions that we we get to see, you know, the the, the wiring's all rubbish. And the, the, if we are going to use the house metaphor for it, um, so yeah, look, I I, I agree with you that, that you know that, that there are these these issues with different organisations. I do think that Deb Anton um, is on the right path in terms of having, I can't remember the terminology, but you know, so if it's CSIRO's data that is being put out there, I never actually give a blanket right for that data to be out there forever. I always I have the opportunity to bring it back if I think the organisation isn't using it in the right way. Um, and. Uh, I think that's actually the right kind of governance to have in place. You know, we shouldn't trust implicitly, and organisations change. Yeah. There were more questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in the latest slide, you have your three points: professionalisation of data and technology management, purposeful creation of enduring data capabilities, yep. and facility that will inspire and research yep. Can you comment on? 
Yeah. So if I go back to the IMOS um, uh, example, some people would say it was a maturity, you know, it's gone through multiple maturity steps. It's enduring because no one questions the benefit of that science. It's not necessarily enduring because of the way the data ecosystem that supports the science has been set up. Um, and so when I say enduring, I'm thinking about it try to get it right the first time, try to build in much, as much machine to machine interaction as you can the first time. And I know in human systems, that's, that's not quite as easy. Um, but there are better and worse ways to do things today. So, you know, agreeing on standards, um, sticking with those standards, training the workforce around, you know, the way the, way the vision that you have for this, for this ecosystem working, they're all hallmarks to me of this enduring um, facility, and if I go back to the five safes, the, the idea behind the five safes is the same, that you've created an organisation that knows its stuff, basically, about how to do data and to, and to, and to fulfil its responsibilities around that data. It's not just cobbling things together, um, you know, it's, it's actually planned, um, it's an you know, investment cycle, all those sorts of things. Does that make sense? Over the past 20 or so years, I've seen in this town, especially a, a degradation, a move away from corporate standards, corporate visions to a more agile, more business focused investment profile, which means that they tend to focus at what that particular business unit wants at the time. Yes. And not really prepared to invest in the big picture. Yeah. So how are you trying to, are you suffering that same sort of paradigm shift that you have to fight against to build a, a managed ecosystem? Yeah, so I've done a few different things in my career. Governance is one of them. I used to do risk in governance. <laughs> Why did I bother doing that? But anyway, I mean, <laughs> we've seen business models for enterprises shift. From you know when you know I'm showing my age, saying you know when I first got involved in 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 technology, everything was run by the Department of Finance, even for CSIRO, um, and uh, you know basically decisions were made at that sort of level. Then we've gone to individual departments and agencies making their own business decisions, being you know, and then and then we've gone to you know, divisions within those agencies making their own um, decisions. That's all well and good if you set up the foundations right. Um, so you can have that agile business focused uh, way of working if pretty much you've got a standards driven base that you can plug and play different solutions into because you're also developing, developing them to core standards. And I think that's, that's the painful part is getting the organisation to agree, you know, what are standards in our organisation um, you know, if you go from the CIO through to the business phase, say, um, you know, where does the CIO's responsibility stop and where does the business phase's responsibility start? My view is the CIO's responsibility actually goes much deeper than, than most people probably, because you end up getting lots of pain if you don't do it, right? Um, so, yeah, it, so it is about... Um, that, that kind of business. And look, the management texts tell you this, stuff, right? If you have a look at some management texts from the last 20 years, they have different business models. Those business models have different types of information technology and data management set up supporting those, those business models. Um, but right now, they're, they're, you, know, you know, build it so that it's um, uh, using cloud logic if you like, so from an infrastructure, everything software anyway. So you know you should you should build it build it that way. Agree on the interoperability standards within your organisation. Um, try and manage um, how apps are developed. So you know have a kind of a standard way of doing apps in your organisation. Um, but I recognise that that's that's actually a different difficult ask for most organisations. So yeah. Maybe I am swimming against the tide a little bit. I'm going to cut yep. off. <laughs> Brendan, thank you very much for that. That's all right. Thought provoking and uh, intriguing to, to see inside what 
the science world organization is doing for us and you're doing with them. Um, join me in thanking Brendan again. You should hit him up with more questions while he's in the Right, thank you. <laughs>